Let's talk about transformation. Let's, let's, let's talk about changing our world. I was 17 years of age when I really established my relationship with God. I was going to school a couple days later on a Friday morning, and I read a passage in Corinthians that said, if we are in Christ, we become a new creation. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. And it was at that moment as a very, as a teenager, a young Christian, I realized that my life had been transformed. And, and I went to school that day as a transformation carrier. I was carrying the message of the good news of what God had done in my life. And I can tell you that throughout my years, this desire to see people know God, have their life incredibly positively changed, has just increased. And the process was very simple. In the beginning, I just wanted to make a difference. If you'd come up to me as a young person, I'd say, I just want to make a difference. I didn't know how I was going to make a difference. I didn't know when I was going to make a difference. I, I didn't even sometimes know why I wanted to make a difference, but I just knew I wanted to make my life count. And over the years, I have found that desire to make my life count, add value to people, see lives be changed, absolutely increase. And that's what the teaching's about today. The teaching about today is transforming in our own life and transformation in the life of others. How, let me just ask you this question. How many of you, as you look now, 2021 in front of us, how many of you would like to improve your life this year? Let's, let's just do a little poll here. Okay, looks, looks pretty good to me. Let, me. let me ask you another question. How many of you would like to see the person that you're sitting beside have their life greatly improved this year? I mean, now, now let me just say something. You were more eager on question two. You, the excitement level on question two was a little bit higher pitched than, than, than on, on, on level one. Well, we're going to talk about how we do it. And, and we have choices. When, when we do, don't like what's happening, we have, we have one of two choices. We can either curse the darkness or we can turn on the light. And, and what we need to understand is that cursing the darkness improves no one's life. But if we turn on the light, all of a sudden we have a, a way that we can bring incredible, beautiful life change to other people. And, and I want to encourage us in this teaching today to turn on the light. And as I talk about changing your world, I'm not the first one to talk about it. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, basically taught a change your world message. Let's look at the scripture, okay? Let's dive into it. It's on the screen. Jesus starts off in his teaching by saying, let me tell you why you're here. Let's stop right there. A lot of people come to me and they say, John, I would really like to know what God's purpose is for me in my life. I would really like to know what God's will for me in my life. And I say, well, you know, it's quite simple. Jesus kind of set that straight at the beginning of his ministry. Let me tell you why you're here. Let me tell you why you are on earth. And now he begins to explain. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Now, he emphasizes again. Here we go. Here's another way to put it. In other words, if you don't understand salt, let me share it with you another thing. You're here to be light. Bringing out the God colors in the world, God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I put you there, on the hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house, be generous with your lives. Oh, this is a huge verse. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God. This generous Father in heaven. Jesus basically said that we change our world by being salt, which makes things better, and light, which makes things brighter. In other words, we are to be catalytic in helping people find God. Now, 
When we begin to understand our responsibility to be catalysts for change, the first thing that we understand is the fact that there are a lot of people who don't want to change. Would you agree with that? How many of you know people who just, they just, they're just kind of stuck in the mud? I mean, they don't, they, yeah, okay, yeah. And, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to ask the question. You, you know it's coming, don't you? How, how many of you are sitting beside that person right now? Okay, we, don't, don't go there. Just, you know, just trust me, don't go there. As I think about change, the reason people don't like it is because it's uncomfortable. It gets them out of their comfort zone. By the way, in COVID-19, as I've shared this year, I've done a lot of, oh my gosh, I've done a, a lot of, of, of virtual teaching. Uh, more, I, I've, I've done more teaching this year than I've ever done to more people than I've ever done. And one of the things I shared with them with this year that we've just gone through is that, that, um, that a crisis is a detour. In, in other words, what a crisis is, is it takes us out of our rhythm and out of our way of doing things. And, and all of a sudden, the, the way that we're familiar with, the way that we understand, the way that we appreciate is taken from us and we're now going a different way. It's a detour. And in fact, I, I've been encouraging everybody, enjoy the detour tour. And the reason you want to enjoy it is because you're seeing things that you've never seen before. You're going places you've never been before. You're experiencing things you've never experienced before. And, and this is where the learning and the growing of life becomes. So, so, so take the tour, tour, and here's the statement. Everything, everything that you want or need, but you don't have, stay with me. Everything that you want or you need, but you don't have it, it's outside of your comfort zone. That's why you don't have it. If it was in your comfort zone, you'd already have it. You would say, oh my gosh, I need that, so I'm going to go get it. You take it and you move on. The only reason that we don't get it is because it's out of our comfort zone. And, and, and what's so beautiful is people are out of their comfort zone right now. They're all on the detour tour, whether they want to be or not. And it's an incredible time for transformation. And here's why. Because when people are hurting, that's when they're willing to make their most important changes in life. Okay, this, this is going to be a little weird to some of you, but I think Christians grieve way too much when adversity comes. I, I, I don't really understand it, but I watch us and we put our hopes in the wrong people and the wrong things, and I can promise you right now that adversity is a friend to Christianity. Church history tells us this. And when I watch Christians say, boy, I just, uh, wow, this would be taken from us. We're going to lose this. I look in there and I say, excuse me, excuse me. I thought that we were pilgrims in this world. I, I, I just had a misunderstanding. I didn't know that this is where we were going to live eternally. I just thought this is where we're passing through. But let's talk about being comfortable or not being comfortable. Just do me a favor right now, quickly. Just cross your arms, okay? Everybody just cross your arms, okay? Now. We've done this thousands of times, haven't we? And let me just say something. Every time you cross your arms, you do it the same way. Every time. You know you've done this thousands of times and you have never done it the other way. Okay, let's do it the other way. Feels so uncomfortable, doesn't it? I mean, this certainly can't be the right way. No, 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 no. Hey, hey, clasp your hands, clasp your hands. Clasp your hands with me, okay? Good. Now, every time you clasp your hands, you do it the same way. Every time, you've done this 10,000 times, every time you do it the same way. You've never done it the other way, but you can clasp your hands. Just move one finger over and let's do it again. Oh. That feel, doesn't that feel uncomfortable? I'm not sure that you can pray with your hands clasped like this. <laughs> I'm not even sure God can hear your prayer if you, I mean, come on, let's get it back to the way it's supposed to be. Let's go get it back to the right way. Now, I say that because people change in four different seasons. This is a whole leadership talk, okay, that I can do for about two hours, but because you're so smart, I'm going to do it in one minute. Honest to God. If I was with most congregations, this would be a series. But you're just smarter. Okay, here we go. Here we go. 
people, people change when they hurt enough they have to, when they see enough they're inspired to, when they learn enough that they want to, and when they receive enough that they're able to. Those are the four times that people change. And I wanna to talk to you about just one of them, the hurting enough that you have to. One year ago, if we were been at Christ Fellowship, there would have been nobody wearing masks. We would have, we would have been looking at 2020 and, and we would have never envisioned all the things that we've had happen to us. This is, I call 2020 the shock and numb year. We've been surprised at what we've seen and then we've seen so much and been so much out of our comfort zone that we're just kind of numb to about everything. But what I want you to grapple with today in being a transformational catalyst is the fact that in hurting times, this is a very opportune time for you to really make a difference. One of the negatives that have come out of all of this is the fact that there has been a, a decline in trust. Uh, I call it the trust fall. I put some stats on the screen. In 1964, 77% of Americans trusted in the federal government. 30 years later, only 20% do. And I know we think, well, you got Vietnam, you got Watergate. Of course, you got all kinds of things that we could point to, but I can tell you it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. I'll come back to that. In 2014, 70% of the people believe that most people can't be trusted. You see, what happens is when we lose our way with values, I'll come back to this. When we lose our way with values, all of a sudden, trust begins to fall. First in institutions, then in people. As I've traveled the world, the difference between countries and cultures that do well and countries and cultures that don't do well is what I call the trust factor. In fact, I want it to be put on your screen so you can visually see it for a moment. Social trust is the confidence that other people will do what they ought to do most of the time. Trust becomes a very vibrant factor that people thrive in when people do what they ought to do. And the word ought catches my attention because where did they get their ought? Where, where, did, where did they get their ought that they do what they ought to do? They got it from learning and living good values. Trust is the environment where people thrive and do well. Now, this is essential. So we ask ourselves, okay, if we're going to see transformation, if we're going to change our world, let's go a step farther. How do we create an environment of trust? It's essential in families. It's essential in communities. It's essential in business. Trust needs to be the core, the center, the fabric of any culture. I'm gonna share with you now four, this is the most practical part of the lesson right here. I'm gonna share with you four ways to create an environment of trust. And what's so beautiful about what I'm about to share is every one of you in the auditorium can do this. We all can do this. It's not out of our reach. It's not something that's impossible. So look at your neighbor before I give you the four things and say to them, even you can do this. Go ahead and tell them that. Even you can do this. Are you ready? Let's go. Number one, we're creating now a trust environment which is conducive for transformation. Number one, value people. A trust environment begins when people feel valued. And the word beside that, which is on your screen, is the word connecting. When we value people, we have the ability to connect with people, and the flip is also true. When we devalue people, we disconnect from people. When people say, I wanna be Christ-like, I say, well, if you wanna be like Jesus, then right at the top of your agenda should be valuing everybody. Because Jesus valued everybody. And when you say, John, what, what do you mean by everybody? See, when I, tell you, when I tell people that they need to value people, they're okay with that. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's good. Value people, got it, got it. But when I point to Jesus, if you want to be Jesus-like, 
He valued everybody. Don't, don't miss this. He valued everybody. There is no person on this earth that God doesn't value. And the only people that have a difficult time with valuing everybody in Jesus' day were the religious people. It it bothered them greatly that Jesus would eat with sinners, that he would hang around with tax collectors, that he would be down in the marker where the hookers were. Bothered them greatly. Why, why are you spending time with him? Why, 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 why are you there? And Jesus is saying, very simple, you got to understand, I'm a doctor. I came to, to take care of sick people. I'm, I'm a shepherd. I'm looking for a lost sheep. Don't miss this. Everybody. There is something engaging and connecting when people that are different than you and me know that they're unconditionally loved by you and me. And to be honest with you, this is where we have, as Christians, utterly failed. When people look at us so many times, they don't see us with unconditional love. And so what does that do? That creates the disconnect. Connect. You see, my perspective of you determines my attitude towards you. How I see you determines my attitude. And, and on, the, on, on the screen again, just don't miss this. If I see you as weak, I will help you. And if I see you as broken, I'll fix you. But if I see you as valuable, I'll serve you. Now, now, just stay right with that for a moment. This is huge. This is huge. Because the first two, see you as weak, I help you. See you as broken, I fix you. In both of those scenarios, if I help you, I come out on top. It's like, oh my gosh, thank you, John. Oh, you rescued me. Oh my, you pulled me out of the ditch. I always look better if I have the perspective of the first two. But the moment that I see you as valuable, I don't now try to be over you. I try to come under you. And I try to serve you. And it's the serving heart. It's the serving. That's why Paul said, I do, I, I'll, I'll go to all kinds of means to win people to Christ. I, I've learned to be a servant. What was Paul saying? Paul is saying, this guy that's incredibly gifted said, I'm going, to, I'm going to serve because the only way to bring transformation to people's lives is, is, is to serve them. So we value people, that word connecting goes with that. Number two, if you wanna have an environment of trust, add value to people. This is all about influence. This is where now I begin to increase my influence by adding value to people. Let me give you an example. When I was a pastor and I was writing books and, and, and much to my surprise when my publisher shared with me that my books were being written by the business community much more than the, commu- uh, than the Christian community. I, I was totally surprised. I had no idea. I was shocked beyond belief. And at that moment, I felt called to go and as a my mission field, the secular community. I, it was at that moment that I knew that I would not pastor much longer, that I would have to spend the rest of my life basically with lost people. And so I began to ask myself, how do I connect with these people? How do I influence these people? And I realized the only way to influence them people and grow and influence strength with them is to add value to them, help them grow their business, help them grow leaders, help them develop. And so I put 100% into helping people, helping people, serving people, adding value, making a difference in their lives. Not much witnessing, not sharing their faith. In fact, I, in, my, in that community, you just, didn't, you, just, you just added value. Add value, add value, add value, until, until my influence got to the place where I could now begin to talk about my faith. Don't miss this. We increase our influence with people by serving them and adding value where they are, no strings attached. Number three, 
If you want to create this type of an environment, you have to live good values, and that's all about attracting people. Attracting people. Paul talks in Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit. Let's look at that on the screen for a moment. The fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all of its varied expressions. Now, now this is a picture here of an attractive person. This is a picture of a person that people want to be around. If you have joy that overflows, if you have peace that subdues, if you have patience that endures, if you have kindness in your actions, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, strength of spirit, that's a pretty attractive person. I kind of want to hang around with them, don't you? That's the fruit of the spirit that's within us. Now, I don't have time to get into it tonight, but just, just, just understand and, and, hey, and get the book, get the book. Look at this last verse. Never set the law above these qualities. For they are meant, what are they? These qualities are meant to be limitless. And when you put the law more important than the values, you diminish the values. I have no time tonight to talk about how we have missed it in America because we've lost our way with values. And we think that legislation will make a difference in people's lives. If the law makes such a difference in people's life, we didn't need the New Testament nor Jesus. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. We lost our way when the laws of the country became more important than the values in a person's life. Trust me. And we won't find our way till we go back to values. Which gets me number four, share good values. That's where the transformation, the transformation begins when we share good values. And, and the four ways to have a, a, create this kind of an environment, value people, add value to people, live good values, share good values. It's, it's, it's all there, folks, it's all there. It's all about values. Go back with me for a moment to 2001. I get a call from Time Warner, that's my publisher. They asked me to come to New York City for an evening. I went up to New York City, we're having a long dinner. And Time Warner asked me, they said, John, because of Enron, remember Enron? Remember all the corporate scandals? Remember all the deviousness and the, and the deceit of, of, of companies in America? And, and so we're having a dinner and, and they said, John, we've looked at all of our authors and we want, we want somebody to write a book on business ethics and we picked you, we want you, would you write a book on business ethics for us? And I looked at him and I said, I, I can't do that. And they said, well, why not? I said, well, there's no such thing as business ethics. <laughs> well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And they went back to all the, no, 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 I got all of it. I got Enron, I got this, I got the, I got the picture. There's no such thing as business ethics. There's just ethics. They said, well, would you write a book on ethics? I said, well, I'll try. I'm not sure I can. In a culture that has no absolutes, that's not an easy thing to do. And so I began to ask myself, how will I write a book on ethics? And after about a month working with my writing team and all of our creative people, we came up with, a, with an amazing thought that I believe God gave us, and that is teach the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. The golden rule is in every culture and every religion in the world. That's a value. And we began to go down the values path and it was life changing for me because all of a sudden I realized Enron will never be straightened out or anyone else will never be straightened out because there's a law on the books. Let me tell you something. If you lack values, you will figure a way to get around the law. Again, it's not an outside issue. It's an inside issue. And the moment that we went that way, we began to understand, we began to understand. And, and so, do you remember when you were, do you remember when you were in school and, and, and the teacher was gonna ask you a question and was talking to the class and, and you didn't know the answer? Now, now, perhaps you weren't like me, but, but there were many times I didn't know the answer because I wasn't the best student in the class, but I was the most fun student in the class. I was the most popular student in the class. I won the best. No, no, no. 
And when the teacher had a question I didn't know, I basically would do this. Let me ask you, how many of you ever hid from the teacher? Okay, I, I, I see some soulmates out there. You weren't that good of a student either, were you? Huh? You, you see, I, I didn't want him to call on me. I didn't want him to call on me because I didn't know the answer. And there were times when I didn't know the answer, but I didn't think they were going to call on me and they were going to call on somebody else. And so I decided to fake it. And I thought, I, I, I don't know the answer, but I'll act like I know the answer. And so I, I would put my hand up like this. And then there were times I knew the answer. And I not only knew the answer, I wanted the teacher to know that I know the answer and I wanted all the classmates to know that I know the answer. I want everybody to know that I know the answer. And when I, knew, when I really knew the answer, my hand went up. When it comes to transformation and changing your world and values, I know the answer. I know the answer. In fact, the reason I'm so passionate about it is I know I know the answer because I've done it now for 25 years with millions of people and it works. And I wish you could be with me. I wish you could be with me when teachers who've been using our values curriculum in their public schools have talked about the change in their students' life. In three weeks, they say they can see the change in their students after value. And by the way, all of our, we, we have five million kids in public schools with our values training, and we've done it international, and we're getting ready to bring it to America. And, 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 and every time I say that, somebody says, well, you'll never get the government to approve. My folks looking at me, listen to me, my name is John, I don't care. The education system is so broken down, it's so hurting, they're starting to look for other answers because they don't have the answer. I'm not one bit concerned. We'll, ta we'll take one school at a time, we'll take one neighborhood at a time, we'll take one community at a time. We will take it and we will move in that direction. And what thrills me, and I don't want to get us too involved, what thrills me is Todd and Julie and I were talking a little bit earlier. He said, John, I, I want us to do some of this in our, in our congregation, and we're going to get together. We're going to talk, and I, want to, I don't want to get ahead of you. I don't want to get ahead of you, Todd, but I, but I want to tell you something. This year could be the greatest year in the history of this church because trans, when you start teaching people in small groups about values, that is preconditional, and that, is pre, that sets up evangelism. It's when people begin to embrace good values, the next thing they are ready to do is hear the good news. But you start with values. And we're, I'm just, I'm just, so, in fact, I, I, I went home, I, yeah, after the service, I went home for an hour and came back. And by the way, I went and took my walk so I could teach my values lesson today for you people to go online and start walking with me virtually. But, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I grabbed Margaret and I said, oh, Margaret, this is, we don't have much time. But, but I told her what Todd and Julie said. And I said, I really believe that, that we could really see something huge happen in our congregation, our church. And, and I'm, t I'm just so excited. I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed because I, I tell you, I tell you, I will give my life for this. I will give my life for this because I see lives being changed. And let me tell you something. I don't have to win every day of my life, but I got to do the right thing every day of my life. And I got to stand for the right values every day of my life. And I'm just, um, I just am, I'm just full of hope. Every year, I have nine questions that I go through at the end of the year. Um, the last week of the, every year, I, I don't go out and speak. Of course, this year, that's not a hard deal. <laughs> but I always set that side aside, aside, and I go through my calendar, like my 2020 calendar. I go through it day, every day and every hour for the whole year. And I do it every day for a week, and, and I have nine questions. And I, and I go through those nine questions, and I, I just... 
Every day I write with a different color, so I'll write with that. I still do use a pen, so I'm so sorry. I, I, you don't relate to that, but that's all right. And, and I'll do it in green, and I'll do it in blue, and then I'll do it. And, and, and I put every day so I layer my thinking so I can see the progress of my thinking. But I have nine questions. And one of the questions that I ask every year is I ask God to give me a word, a word for that year. And this year, I got my word earlier than ever before. In fact, I got my word by the middle of December. I wasn't even asking for the word, and God gave it to me. Usually, I mean, one year, it was literally 11 o'clock on New Year's Eve before I got my word. I thought that was a little close, but God thought I was a little slow. But this year, I think he wanted me to make sure I got, so he gave it to me. He gave me the word in the middle of December. So I've had two weeks to look, and the word is hope. The word is hope in a world that just, no matter where I am, in, in the last three months, I've, I've, I've had per, personal audiences with the president of Costa Rica. I've had personal audiences with the president of, of, of Guatemala. I've, 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 I've talked to Supreme Courts of countries. I, I've, I've had, I've had a, 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 some pretty major entrances in the last three or four months. And now all of them are looking at us. And in fact, in, when we were in Costa Rica, the Secretary of Education said, we're, Costa Rica, the president just signed on, that every public school in Costa Rica will take our values curriculum. And, and, and then as we finished, the Secretary of Education said, you do know that seven other secretaries of education in Latin America have contacted me and said, if we do it, they want to do it also. And by the way, you're very generous with Equip. And every year for many, many years, out of your missions budget, out of your birthday gift for Jesus, that's such a report, 2.6 million. That's, that, is it, I don't know, I, I might be wrong. Isn't that the best that we've done? No, we've done better. We've done better? But we'll get there. And it's in a COVID year. It's in a COVID year. Let me, your, your, your birthday gift to Jesus, your birthday gift to Jesus, the, it goes for all kinds of wonderful helps. And one of them, you, you help us. You help us with, with the values curriculum and thanks for doing it. And, and I, I, wanna, I wanna say thank, thank you for that. But, but just let me, I gotta close. But he gave me the word hope. And then he gave me three words with it. Prosperity, affluence, and security. Prosperity, if you look at the word prosperity in the dictionary, it means to go forward with hope. Isn't that beautiful? When people talk about prosperity, it means to go forward with hope. So he said, John, I want you to teach people a prosperous life of, of going forward in hope. And affluence means to have a, a, a flow of abundance in your life. Not have a scarcity mindset, but to have a flow of abundance in your life. Hope is, is about abundance. It's, it's all about moving forward. And then security means having faith that's greater than fear. So that's my word. I gotta wrap it up, I know I do. But I just want you to know, precious friends, that if we'll commit ourselves this year to setting an environment of trust and that we will be unconditional in our love and in our actions and in our lifestyle, that we're going to have the greatest harvest year ever in this church. The greatest year ever. And, and I, just, I, just, I just want to close the service with prayer. This, I love the prayer emphasis on this night. I, I, this, this, if you're going to have prayer emphasis on, on the five o'clock service, this is going to be my favorite service. Because I, 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 I love it when the body comes together in prayer. Father, I just humble myself before you. And, and these precious friends, people, these people that love you, and they've been transformed. Their life has been changed.
If we're going to be transformational, if we're going to change our world, it starts with us. So I pray that you would give a, a, a spiritual, renewing, transformational movement that begins in our heart. Start with me, oh God, start with me. But now I pray, Father, that you would see the heart of Christ fellowship. It's the same heart as you, Father, when you gave your only son for this world. It's a, it's a heart for people to come to God. And I'm gonna pray a prayer of anointing and favor and covering and blessing over this congregation and over every one of these individuals, Father, in their business, in their family, in their community. May we start transformation tables. And, and, and Father, may we see good people learn and embrace good values. And may they be lifted up so that we can be salt and light in the community that we live. I, I just, I cover Todd and Julie and I cover the staff. And I just pray, God, that you'll give them an anointing, a great commission anointing, that they will lead us. And Father, I pray that you'll give all of us a heart for people. May we love people like you love people. And may we reach people as you so desperately want us to reach people. So we give you ourselves and we thank you for hearing our prayer. And we believe that this year, this is going to be the year that lives are transformed. If you can believe that in the name of Jesus, would you just stand with me and let's claim it together as a congregation. Let's claim it together as a congregation. That's right, let's claim it together as a congregation. Lift him up, lift him up. Only God, only God, give that to us. Give that to us as a congregation. Give that to us in the name of Jesus.